Welcome to my channel. Hi guys, how are you doing? It's a beautiful, kind of sunshiny day out here. Uh, about 18 degrees um, Celsius. And I, you know, it, it's, I'm starting to feel like my old self again. I'm going very slowly. I, I don't want to bring on any of those horrific body aches that I was having before my antibiotics. It took two doses to knock them right out of me, but um, I, I had other things going on, like a very sore throat, and so I'm not sure exactly what went on, but I, I do have some pain from time to time. Whenever I do something strenuous, uh, but it goes away. It's, I have taken two painkillers in the past three weeks. So for me, that's kind of promising. Um, anyway, welcome back to my channel and to another episode of Missing Kids. And um, I'm going to do a little bit of shopping now because I'm anticipating um, doing a little more spring cleaning. I'm going to do my balcony and kitchen windows, but very slowly, maybe one day at a time. I have to move all my plants in order to do the windows, so it's going to be a very, very big job. And I need some um, cleaning things, and uh, I need some rubber mats for the floor. So I'm on my way to pick those up now. And um, yeah, so before I get into the story, we're going to um, first go to the dollar store and do a little window shopping. Today's um, episode is going to be uh, a very brief review of a vintage case, um, a cold case of a child who went missing but was ultimately found still warm uh, just a few hours after she vanished. So her name was Patricia Lupton, and stick around, we're going to get into that very soon. So um, here is my haul, and I did finally manage to find these rubber mats for underneath my plants. They will go under the plastic mats that I already have there, and um, I, I bought three of them, and I'm so happy to have found them. I have one more at home, so I think that will do me, and it will save the, store, uh, the floor from getting, you know, those brown stains from dirty water. It comes out anyway, but just, you know, to save my, the ceramic tiles underneath. Um, garbage bags, and I don't know what happened to mine. I probably threw them out, so I need a pair of these. And I all out of twine. I need them for, um, you know, propping up my long basil leaves that just keep flopping over. 
And yes, I am long overdue for one of these because the one that I have on my steering wheel right now has such bumpy seams it takes off all of my nails. So this is much nicer and it feels wonderful to my to my fingers. And um, yes, this is, I've been told it's very good. Um, I, I normally do just purchase white vinegar, but um, I don't, you know what this is for? You know when you buy a plant and you don't transplant it and you get all those little white spiders in the store's planter? Well, I, I didn't have many at all this year because I quickly transplanted everything that I had and threw the um, original ones out. So anyway, um, yeah, this is, this is what I'm going to use. I have... Um, when I do my windows, I'm going to put this right on the bottom and spray it clean. So, um, yeah, that will be absolutely, it'll do the trick. I don't have, I'm so happy that I don't have any at all this year. I think the ones that I'm seeing are the dead ones from last, last fall. But anyway, oh, and one bottle of water. And so um, all that came to approximately $29. So um, let's get started with the story of Patricia. And um, sometime between the cold case disappearances of Richard Marlowe and Eileen Williams, another child vanished as well in the 50s. But um, this is not actually another case of a missing child, and we will get to that soon. And so, okay, let's get to Patricia. Patricia was a very beautiful and well-liked little girl who was popular in school and had lots of friends. Um, like Eileen, she was also a very mature and responsible child who adored younger children. And so uh, what she did, guys, was that she, um, you know, she, she loved young children so much that she turned that passion into a career for herself and began to babysit for money. And she did quite well. She was quite... Um, uh, responsible. She was in demand and families loved her. So, um, okay. Um, let's get on to the story, uh, the day that she disappeared, which was February 16th, um, 1959. And so, um, uh, in 1959, 12-year-old Patricia Lupton and her th three friends um, saw a babysitting notice um, posted in a bulletin board at the local AMP supermarket in the Kennedy Park Shopping Plaza at Kennedy Road in Eglinton in my city. And now, guys, I'm familiar with that um, intersection because I worked there for three years, just around the corner from there. And I didn't take you to the original spot because um, it, it's much too busy and it, it's changed probably quite an awful lot uh, since this um, tragedy occurred. And so I, I don't think it would have been any use to show you. The AMP is no longer there and the mall itself has changed so much. And so, um, okay, so that's, that's what happened. These girls decided one day after school to go to the AMP and look for jobs on the bulletin board. And so, um, I, I'm not sure if that was a first for them or if they were in the habit of doing this and that's how they found other babysitting jobs, but her friends were also babysitters. There's a little bit of a discrepancy um, regarding some of the details of this story, and I'm going to just lay it out um, right here. It says that it was on February 16th that 
the girls noticed the um, bulletin board uh, ad. And so, um, it, but however, it was in March that um, Patricia actually got a response back and went missing. So let's get to that. I, I just, in case you want to look up the story and you notice these details, yeah, it's a little sketchy, but it's easy enough to figure out. And so, okay. Uh, on February the 16th, the girls all put their names and addresses and phone numbers for the ad. I believe it was one ad and not several ads. And they all had had a history of babysitting, so it would be a piece of cake for them. They had references, and it, it, it sounds to me that the girls knew what they were doing. And so um, now, as you know, guys, um, like this bulletin board, and I still see that situation going on in, in many supermarkets, in many local uh, supermarkets. So I'm just saying, you know, things like this can be um, quite problematic and um, actually quite dangerous too um, for anyone, let alone a young child or a young girl. And so this was a very clear case, as we will see, a very clear case of child luring. And, but this was how things were routinely done in the 50s. And so, um, you know, because in the 50s, nothing was digital, right? Um, and so, unless I'm missing something. And so I am not at all being critical of anyone, not the supermarket, not the parents of the girls who allowed them to do this. No, that's how things were done, you know, and... Um, I would say that in, in the 50s, it, the city wasn't that dangerous with with situations that I'm going to be describing to you right now. It weren't that dangerous. So anyway, um, let's get on with the story. So um, that was February the 16th. Now we're moving up to March the 9th of the same year, 1959, and Patricia received a call from a man who answered um, her response to the ad. So she re replied to the ad, and the man was getting back to her. Now, um, uh, Patricia was not the only girl who received a call back. And I, I, one thing that I want to say right here is that we don't have any details um, of the other girls, only that, um, I'm going to get into it in a second, only that Patricia was the first one who was, who got the, um, who had the scheduled babysitting job. And so bear with me. Um, she received a call and two of her other friends, uh, also, um, did, get responses but one missed the callback and as the line was busy and um now i believe that they're talking about the man the man who called her and she called him back but the line was busy when she called him back and so the other girl never bothered responding back at that moment because she fell ill I would say that those two other girls were extremely lucky.
fun. <laughs> and so, um, the next um, part of the story continues with the cold case unit of my city um, uh, getting, um, getting notified by the parents. And so, they said that Patricia did receive a call at the house um, about a babysitting job from a man who identified himself as Johnston, Johnson. Mr. Johnson told her that he and his wife, I don't know if the wife existed, uh, were visiting their infant son in the hospital and needed a babysitter for their slightly older son. So, hearing this story for the first time makes sense because, you know, in hospitals, um, visiting hours are over early enough, like about 8 o'clock, something like that. And so, the Johnsons probably would have returned home at a decent hour. And so, I'm wondering why the older son couldn't have gone along um, to the hospital for a visit, but I don't even think the story was true, so let's continue. Um, so, uh, they needed the babysitter for the older son. Okay. Uh, up until this point, the story may be factual. And um, they may indeed have been an older Johnson boy. So, Patricia did agree and was very, very excited um, as she liked taking care of younger children. And so I'm not sure or clear how old this slightly older boy would have been, but probably younger than 12. If he wasn't, there would have been a problem, right? And so um, Patricia agreed. And um, she was quite uh, anxious to get started to work. And so she was supposed to get um, picked up by Mrs. Johnson at the Kennedy Park drugstore um, in that same AMP plaza where the ad was posted. And so um, she was going back to the same mall. And I, I believe this would have been a strip mall, something like that. And so those were the arrangements initially. And um, obviously, something was going to change. Uh, there would have been a change of plans, only we're not sure exactly what happened. So um, let's continue. Uh, her parents, um, meanwhile, back at home, felt safe with um, Patricia accepting this job as she was very highly regarded uh, by the people that she previously babysat for. And so she told her parents where she was going, that she was going to check in with the with her parents as soon as um, she got to the Johnsons. And so it's highly unlikely that she probably ever even made it there. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what might have happened to her uh, in between, but I'm not sure. So, um, she she was invited to come down to the local store um, uh, where Mr. Johnson was working and meet him. So, I, okay, the arrangement, therefore, would have been that Mrs. Johnson was going to pick her, pick Patricia up and bring her to the store, the family business, whatever. And so uh, then Mr. Johnson was going to take her to babysit his child and then bring her back to the store that night. And I'm wondering, guys, why not just bring her home? But, you know, maybe those were safe um, plans. Those were the details. It's highly likely that she lived very close to the mall, so it wouldn't have been a problem. But um, anyway, those were the plans. That was the arrangement, that he would bring her back to the store and not home to her house. 
it's weird, guys. It's weird. Um, to me, uh, as a parent, I would have said, no, you bring her here, home. Don't bring her back to the store. Uh, it probably the store would have been closed. You know what I'm saying? Um, stores close 8, 9 o'clock at night. And so it was at 5.30 p.m. that Patricia left her own house to walk to the mall, the plaza. So Patricia Lupton was last seen leaving her residence en route to um, the Kennedy Park Plaza and um, sometime between 5.30 and 6.20 p.m. So in between that time, she was seen leaving and getting to the mall. And so, but her call that was supposed to be placed to her parents um, when she arrived at the Johnsons never came. And so her parents waited and waited and worried until it was far too late. And they knew that something had gone wrong. And so they called the police. Meanwhile, guys, meanwhile, while they were reporting her missing, um, unknown to them, her body was indeed found still warm uh, at just 7.20 p.m. on March the 9th, 1959, um, laying in a snowbank on McCowan Road, less than two miles from her home and four miles north of the plaza where she was last seen alive. Wow, not very far a stretch at all. Trisha Lupton was just 12 years old when police found her off this roadway um, on McCowan Road, south of Ellesmere in Scarborough, due to, um, she had been strangled, st strangled, guys. She had been strangled, and um, she, um, you know, the field where her body was abandoned, um, near there was uh, a broken car horn ring found very close to her body and police did consider did consider this a very um significant and possible clue and so um her body was was hadn't been there that long and so um but despite the life-saving efforts made by emergency um personnel the young girl was uh, pronounced dead at the scene. She didn't even make it, you know, to the hospital. She had already been gone by the time they got there. She had suffered from injuries, been strangled, and a scarf was knotted very, very tightly around her neck. And she had been strangled to death, guys, with her own scarf. And her knees were bruised and clothing in disarray. And she had not been essayed, but it can be very well assumed that that had been the motive, and she had struggled very, very um, viciously for her life. And, um, you know, it, probably it would have been the motive, and she would have ultimately ended up the same way. And so um, there had been a very intense and... and um, very um, purposeful hunt for this man who probably, it wasn't even probably his name, Johnson, and um, the perpetrator was never, ever caught. And so I think that we can probably safely assume that uh, between 6.20 and 7.30 p.m., or whenever it was, I believe it was something like 7.20 p.m., barely an hour had passed since she was picked up by Mrs. or Mr. Johnson. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming there was never a store. There was never a family home. There was never an older child, because even that story, um, you know, why would parents not just bring 
the child along with them, you know, uh, uh, to the hospital. There even was something a little bit strange about the story and the arrangements of her going back to the store. I, I think it was, um, all of that was done to lengthen the, um, the time frame and give the perpetrator more time for uh, Patricia to be with him and um, not being noticed missing until he had had enough time with her. But um, she was apparently not essayed, and um, I, what she must have endured would have been so horrific, guys. Um, not even uh, 12 years old, and she was already gone, um, all because of a babysitting job. So that's the sad story of Patricia Lupton and how her babysitting job ultimately went. And what I'm so disappointed in is that we, there are no other details of um, any other girls responding to the AMP ad. I'm assuming it was taken down immediately after this uh, situation arose. And um, uh, how horrific, because um, here was a young girl just starting out, doing things that she loved to do, going to school, babysitting, and there was nothing odd or strange about a young girl taking on a babysitting job. Although I think that maybe perhaps a 12-year-old child being alone at home at night may not be the best idea but um that's ultimately what the plan would have been and so it, it it's a strange story and um no the perpetrator was never ever found or apprehended nothing ever happened and uh, i don't even know if they had been able to collect any dna from uh, Patricia's body, could they, could they go back and and try to get some DNA? Um, I'm not sure how things uh, were back then scientifically, and so um, I'm imagining that it might have been someone who has been since caught doing things to other people. I'm imagining and hoping it was, but we'll never know. So. Um, yeah, that's it for now. Bye.